Hello everyone, it's me again, Matmus. Thank you so much for joining me today. So, future technology for military application is something I've always had a strong fascination with. The technology that's being produced for future generations of soldiers, airmen, sailors, marines, whoever it may be, is just extraordinary. And the rate that it's progressing and the speed of which this technology is potentially going to be adapted to future soldiers uh, and other service members is just going to be incredible to see in the next 10 to 20 years. The most interesting thing about some of the technologies you're going to see in this video and some of the key concepts that people want to bring into the military markets is the it can never happen. That's not going to work. It doesn't seem practical. And most of these ideas are purely in the concept phase. Some of the things that I really find the most fascinating is augmentation and vision screening. I having the ability to see the battlefield through a different picture other than just seeing it through your own eyes. It's a huge feature that I guarantee in the next 20 to 30 years all infantry based soldiers and especially vehicle based soldiers marines whoever it may be will have this technology implemented them as the war fighter on the battlefield it's going to happen folks it will happen we are not going to just rely upon our own human eyeball to engage find locate whatever it may be enemy targets friendly targets they already have this technology in place now i'm not saying that this is ready to fly out to the you know the war fighter it's ready to go uh, it's a long, long way from there. There is a lot of different designs that have been put in place. They're looking into trying to improve them. And I think that's really the focus um, that most military markets in the technology front are focusing on to try and improve these already existing, you know, concepts and ideas. But on today's video, I want to discuss a video that I stumbled across um, from the US Army. Now, this is actually a video kind of showcasing the features that they would like to see for the future warfighter and their soldiers and the technological, um, you know, setup that they want to try and place on an infantry soldier specifically. Now, some of the features are a little far-fetched. I mean, when you see some of the things that are requiring and the kind of wanting to try and bring into place, it seems a little out there. But as I mentioned, you know, things will eventually change to the point where we have technologies to be able to fulfill these things that they're asking. I mean, folks, come on, let's look at the F-22 Raptor. Do you think 60 years ago, you know, people would think that thing will never exist, it will never appear? Here it is, the F-22, you know, many other fighter jets, I'm just using the F-22 as an example, I know many of you will get very upset if I don't mention any other aircraft other than the F-22. But it's just, a, just an example, you know, there's a lot of technology out there that we never would have thought existed, I'm sure, many years ago, and here we are today. So, you may look at some of these features that will come up in this video and think, yeah, no way, it's not going to happen, crazy, crazy, crazy. But I really do think we have to look at it in more of a broad mindset and open our minds a little bit to, um, you know, the advances that could potentially happen to a modern day infantry soldier. Now, we are focusing on the infantry specifically today because this video kind of goes over the key points of what an infantry soldier will have. We do see a lot of markets out there already having a ton of adaptive technology. You can see some of the footage here of the different uh, platforms that can be placed onto a weapon system. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, there are so many different levels of military technology that you can adapt these kind of things to and I think we're going to see a lot more of it coming up in the future you know the British Army with the Virtus system although a very simplistic design it is trying to feature onto how much equipment a soldier can carry and how we can adapt that augmentation is something I'm really interested in I'm sure in the next 30 years we're going to have these kind of uh, suits, mechanical suits to be able to carry a lot more equipment. I recently got issued my Canadian Army rucksack, which or Bergen as Brits call it, which is absolutely massive. And I was thinking as I was looking at all of my equipment that I needed to put into this thing and the potential to fight in a winter environment with all that heavy, you know, warm kit that you may be carrying or wearing, the weight must be astonishing, including that of ammunition, etc, etc, specialist equipment. There's going to be a time when we need to really focus on what will allow us to carry more further without damaging the human body uh, and I think that's something I'm most interested in for sure. Also the uh, eye technology that's coming out, the different types of headsets can be placed on the soldier to see targets, friend or foe, that is always super super interesting because I think that's something a lot of technologies uh, are trying to work on right now out there and you know how cool would it be to put a headset on and it just gives you a huge battle picture. Anyway, let's have a look at this video, go over it and some of the key features that they're looking for and uh, we'll go from there.
So first things first, clothing. Now you're probably thinking this really isn't a key attribute to the warfighter or soldier on the battlefield, but when you think about it, it really, really is. When it comes to being comfortable, um, ergonomics, being able to move your body and utilize your body correctly on the battlefield is really important. If you have clothing that is restricting that, that can cause some serious problems. Um, now, in this kind of basis, they've keyed off about six different points here. So let's just go through the kind of features that they're looking at. So, regionally adaptive combat ensemble. What that basically means is where they're trying to develop, I guess, a camouflage-based system that can adjust to the environment you're in. Something that is definitely sci-fi and high-tech. It's basically saying camouflage that can adapt to the technology you're in. You know, almost a mirroring software. Something that would be extremely interesting to see in the next hundred years. I don't think we're anywhere near that kind of high-tech technology quite yet for the human body, considering there's so many contours uh, and movements that happen. And also the fact that when you're breaking contact onto the floor and rubbing the equipment and catching it on things, you can tear it, rip it, whatever it may be. Even if you did have this technology, it would have to be extremely robust uh, to be able to handle the stresses of being involved in a combat environment. But something I definitely think um, will be interesting to see in the future, and, you know, camouflage being one of the most important parts may not even be as applicable with some of the other technologies we're going to see later on in this video. Uh, a novel functional fabrics and finishes. So basically, you know, they're trying to improve the functionality of clothing, being able to repel, you know, water from rain, oils and lubricants being involved with, you know, gun oils and all that sort of stuff. So something that's really more uh, protective of the finishes of the, you know, the clothing you're wearing. Uh, adaptive signature management. Again, they're trying to reduce the visibility of the soldier on the battlefield, being able to be seen from, you know, high tech vision systems, whatever it be on a vehicle or just from a troop. Uh, being able to see them. So whether that's, you know, a jamming software, some kind of reflective material that prevents, you know, certain sight and systems seeing it. Again, way down the line, but these are kind of the things they're trying to look at doing. Because, you know, you could be covered in the best camouflage in the world. If thermal imaging is seeing you, you don't have much choice than to be seen at that point. Um, health status monitoring, of course, quite important for the soldiers to be able to look after one another if you have a medic in your group. The clothing could technically... Um, check whether or not you're bleeding in certain areas. I was reading an article the other day that they're trying to adapt clothing that has sensors within each part of the major uh, body parts, legs, arms, head, neck, chest, whatever it may be, that can detect drops of blood. You know, if you've actually been hit somewhere, it can be very difficult sometimes for a medic to find where that hit has taken place on your body. I know that for a fact in Afghanistan, uh, we had soldiers who had been hit and Sometimes it's not as simple as bullet comes in, blood comes out. It can take a while sometimes for the blood to seep through certain wounds due to the cauterization of certain kind of projectiles or explosives. So, you know, they can't find the, the entry wound and or find the area of which things have happened. This kind of technology will allow that to better suit the medics to triage and find that wound very, very quickly, which I find uh, extremely fascinating to be able to, you know, basically save lives a lot quicker. The integrated data power distribution, so of course they're looking into all these different fancy bits of electronics they're going to try and put on these soldiers, but how are they going to power all this stuff? How are they going to get the feed of all these connections, these, you know, uh, sockets, unions, you know, clips, whatever it may be, that connect all these electronic compa compatibilities up? That's going to be quite difficult. You know, we don't want cables and wires hanging all off us, getting tangled up on us. They're actually starting to think, can they stitch the wiring into the sleeves, pants, chest, um, of this kind of clothing to allow it to all hook up to your system. It's very fascinating stuff. And the last one is pretty self-explanatory, integrated protection of the systems that you have around you. So trying to make sure that if you have this kind of equipment on, can it integrate to something else that you're going to wear on later on? Can it be interchangeable between soldier and soldier? You know, do you have to have a specific setup or can it be universal for multiple different uh, systems? And I think that's something that's going to be a real challenge if they make this kind of technology or this kind of equipment. Can every soldier wear it or only specific soldiers? Maybe we're looking at only special forces wearing this kind of equipment. So those of you who have deployed in an operational environment, or those of you who have been in any kind of military setup, even if it's just airsoft, and you're running around in the cold or the heat, you know that you want to be comfortable as much as possible to allow you to fight longer and harder. Being super hot is not only dangerous, but it affects your overall combat capability. If you can't get your cooling down in your body temperature, you're going to have a hard time fighting, concentrating, 
aiming, whatever else it may be. This microclimate vest is not that new and it's actually being developed as we speak. This is going to be really interesting, I think, in the next 10 years. This technology is going to boom and potentially be fully implemented into especially frontline soldiers. I don't think quite so much the troops in the background, but for sure frontline soldiers being able to keep their bodies cool or warm in the environments that they're in. So for me, personally, this is the most, I guess, applicable and interesting technology that I think is going to be adapted to the modern day soldier, airman, sailor, whoever it may be. Human augmentation is something that we have tried doing for quite some time. It's not new. You know, we've tried different types of uh, robot systems, leg braces, back restraints, lifting arms to allow us to lift heavy weights. There's tons of it out there. It's not quite ready yet. We've got a long way to go. But the fact that they've done leaps and bounds pun the pun, uh, to bring this technology to the modern day battlefield is really impressive. Now increased speed of movement is something that we have to be careful with because you could put an augmented machine onto your legs and these braces etc but the human body can only do so much um, and it is a little nerving that they're going to try and produce these kind of systems and they may malfunction. I can just imagine someone running it you know, 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, you know, something doesn't work and he rips his own leg off. I mean, I'm, I'm just speculating here. It's kind of totally sci-fi. But it is something that I think we need to think about in terms of, yes, it's going to make them run a little faster, but I don't think we're quite going to see it like we see in the movies where they're sprinting, you know, 50 miles an hour down the road. There is our limits to human nature. Our evolution will not allow us to keep up to certain kinds of systems. However... Increased load capacity is definitely something I think they're more focused upon at the moment. Trying to increase that load capacity of the modern day soldier. When you think about the kind of equipment that we're carrying nowadays and these new systems that we want to bring in place, these heavier radios, mine detection equipment, heavy weapon systems, ammunition, um, all these headsets that we're putting on the troops now, all this extra body armor, the increased capability of penetrating rounds that need this extra body armor. We're increasing the huge amount of weight soldiers already were carrying many many years ago so this is something i think they're going to try and focus on more than they are the speed of the soldier moving forward you know being that i will be a future artillery gunner it would be nice to be able to carry you know three or four boxes of 105 millimeter shells to the front of the gun line without having to ask for help or to do multiple runs i can just put on this suit or put on these braces pick it up and off i go that's where i want to see this technology going it also will apply very well for you know Jumping. Your jumping is pretty important when it comes to trying to overcome obstacles. Assault courses will almost be redundant if we have this kind of technology come through. So I think this is really the key focus that they're trying to push on this kind of technology. Reduced fatigue is, again, something we have to kind of bear in mind to human nature. Yes, it will reduce fatigue, but as to what extent will it increase fatigue? Putting these heavy braces and equipment onto the human body already may, you know, be counterintuitive. We may have to add these kind of legs and braces to the arms, chest, legs, whatever it may be, of the human body. And the increased weight is actually counteractive. It's not really making um, much productive use other than a small margin. And that may not just be cost effective. You know, militaries may say, okay, so we're getting an extra 30 kilograms of you know, effort for three hours of a soldier doing it, is it really worth the $2.5 million contract it's going to cost us to implement this kind of system? The only other thing that I worry about these kind of, you know, uh, mechanisms is the fact that they could fail. And what do you do when this thing fails? You know, if you're in a tactical situation and they break, you can't just dump them and, and leave them off to the side of the track. You're going to get found. That's just waste metal now that you have to carry around. You know, lubricating hinges and, you know, maintenance of this kind of equipment. It's almost like maintenance on top of your own human maintenance of the equipment that you're trying to move with. So there's a lot of things that I think we're not quite seeing in the background that may cause a little bit of a red tape for this kind of system, but still exciting nonetheless.
Now, for this particular topic, I could make an entire new video on this. There's so much information that we could discuss, but to go over it briefly, there are some key features that I think we should discuss. First of all, advanced sensors for dismounted situational awareness. Now, this kind of technology already kind of exists. The Germans have been really pushing on this kind of technology with the sighting systems on their not only firearms, but headsets, to be able to communicate between soldier and soldier as to what they're seeing. For instance, one soldier is patrolling down a street, doesn't see a target coming up, another is patrolling down a different street and sees that target or threat coming towards the other. They can share that you know, data link, that live feed as to what's going on and improve that situational awareness. I think that's something that's really going to be putting into place within the next five to ten years. You know, actual um, all forward frontline soldiers having that ability to see more predict more and prevent more uh, issues for them coming up in the combat situation so you know that's an expensive i think investment for many militaries to invest in but overall it's going to benefit the soldiers and the troops on the ground quite a bit information portrayal assessment and displays is pretty much what i just discussed soldier data management again knowing what your platoon or your troop is doing at the time uh, if you have a section squad whatever it may be you want to know the ammo count you can actually see your ammo counts of live of what your troops have in your i guess battle management screen on your own tablet whatever it may be and even headsets nowadays that they're trying to produce you know if your rifle is actually implementing data to a system that your squad lead can see how many rounds you have left so that you can call in resupply uh, hold off the next attack whatever it may be you can even tell one of the troops hey you've only got five rounds left in your mag put a fresh mag in snap snap to it like stopping a mong uh, those kind of things really interesting i think it's going to be a lot of intricacies to do that and maybe a lot of money to invest and like i said many years down the line but something that i think they're probably going to do uh, on demand resupply as i mentioned trying to get your troops resupplied having that on the go live update feed of what's going on with your troops again the same thing applies for health status monitoring i discussed it with the medics being able to know exactly what's wrong with you uh, control of multiple micro UAVs and UGVs. I'm not going to go into that very heavily. It's a whole new topic when it comes to UAVs and all that sort of stuff. But we know fine well that UAVs are going to be integrated into the modern day warfighter very heavily. That isn't new. That is not futuristic. It's happening right now. Um, supports dismounted MUMT operational environments. Yes, again, trying to integrate with other technologies is something that they want to try and impl implement. Uh, slim and lightweight IO package, you know, they want to keep everything light. There's no point producing all this extra equipment, making this big old ergonomic brace on your leg that allows you to carry it all. It's just counterproductive. So they want to keep it slim and lightweight. Real-time tactical uplink, that's very important. Trying to get a good battle picture to your command elements, knowing exactly what's going on at the time. There's always a delayed feed when it comes to the battle management systems we have nowadays, especially on the troop side of things. When it comes to vehicles, there's more high-powered radios, GPS satellite uplinks, more power from the vehicle engine and batteries that allow them to get that high-frequency signal to relay signal communications back to HQ or whoever else it may be. When it comes to the infantry soldiers, they don't have all that capability. They normally have a you know, low rate GPS or radio system on their backpack. Sometimes it hasn't just quite, quite the oomph to get that live feed or real time tactical uplink back to uh, HQ. So hopefully in the future, that's something we'll see more of. Active and passive tactical status linking. So, you know, if we have all this technology, we wanna make sure that someone else can't hack into it or find it. That's a big threat to me. And that's something I do worry about these kind of technologies. It's just, someone's always going to counter something you produce whether it be hacking into it cutting the feed whatever it may be so if we're going to make these kind of things let's make something that we can actually shut down in a stealth tactical environment and fire back up again where it's safe so lots of things to talk about there lots of things that i think are already in place but also some things there are a little sci-fi a little out there but i think in the bigger picture they're definitely coming and it's going to be really really cool when the modern day warfighter gets this kind of stuff Is it just me, or does this look like the trailer for Armor 4? <laughs> I'm just saying. Like, you know Armor 4 is coming, and I think this is probably where they're going to focus it on. It'd be interesting if they do, but I really hope they don't make it cringy with some really gross, futuristic, like, hardcore futuristic stuff, like lasers and all that sort of stuff. But I think this is where Armor 4 is going to go with things. So of course, when you have this kind of technology, we have to 
go within the dimensions of which the human body and human nature will allow us to do. But they're even trying to push that boundary. So first of all, the simplistic side of things, we need to train, we need to know how to use this kind of equipment that's going to come into place. Uh, and they want to have something that can be adaptive and, and can actually be put into simulation. So, you know, we have a lot of technology now where we play laser tag. It's like very large laser tag. If you've ever done it before, it's very, very good fun. All of a sudden you'll be sat in your vehicle, a bomber will go over, a pretend bomber will go over, and your little chess piece will say, you have been destroyed by a bomb from a plane. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's also really frustrating. You get the guy that runs around the god gun just shooting people randomly and you have to get reset. But anyway, what I'm trying to say here, folks, is that kind of technology I think is going to push really, really heavy in the next 10 to 20 years. It would actually be my dream career now that I'm retired out of the full-time military to work with that kind of technology. I know there's a few companies out there that are you know, trying to uh, bring in more high-tech systems when it comes to simulation and immersive simulation systems laser tag right now is the furthest that we've got but there could be systems on which we have um, more in-depth laser tag you know being able to shoot from many many miles away uh, everything ties into one there's there's a huge spectrum of uh, options and ideas that you can have for simulation software and systems that you can put into all these different products they're going to produce the next thing goes into the more creepy and scary side of things, neural engineering, actually potentially putting implants uh, into your own body or affecting your neural um, capabilities when working as a soldier. A little scary, I think we're starting to look into, you know, uh, almost in some regard, um, adapting the human body's own functions to go further than they should before. I don't know how they're going to do it. A little scary, but something they're probably going to look into in the many years to come. Optimize human performance. Again, we only have so far we can go. What can we do to push that boundary a little further? There's been talk of um, injections that you can take to prevent pain in general, but still fight completely fine and still be okay. There's been talk of injections that allow you to prevent it from needing sleep for an extra 24 hours. There's been many, many options for trying to make the human body push further than it needs to, that it's normally used to, you know, and we could create our special forces to almost almost be like super soldiers. And again, I know I'm really going out to town there. If you've ever seen the movie Soldier, which is one of my favorite movies in the world with the climb and the chains and all that good stuff, fantastic movie. But I think that's kind of what they're looking at. You know, what other options do we have here? You know, if the enemy is getting smarter, what can we do to be that one step ahead? little scary in my eyes, but you know, this is just a, a showcasing video, but I think someone somewhere in a bunker is thinking of these kind of things, uh, and you know, not a bunker, but you know, a lab or whatever it may be, thinking, you know, what can we do to push the limits, to push the boundaries of, you know, soldiers to the day, and it does make me a little nervous. Nutritional intervention, so this is interesting, basically I was reading a newspaper article the other day of, they're trying to find technology that allow you to say, as a soldier, look, you haven't eaten much today. I've done your calorie counts, almost like a military Fitbit. Uh, it tells you you've done so many steps, you've done this many altitude, this many distance, whatever it may be. You need to eat, you need to drink. I can tell you're highly dehydrated. Sometimes as a soldier, even though we tell ourselves you need to hydrate, you need to hydrate, we just forget or we're just so busy into the depth of what we're doing that we just don't drink. And there could be a system that could be on your equipment, your uniform, or even on your body that tells you, hey dude, you are way dehydrated go drink water right now, or it can even just give you a progress update as to how much percentage of liquid or you know water that you have taken into your body and how you can kind of meet that perfect equilibrium for uh, not too much, not too little. And that comes to food too, calorie counts, all that good stuff. So really interesting stuff. And finally, uh, physiological status monitoring, so overall body health monitoring so you know is your muscles getting too strained do you need to you know take a break whatever it may be many many different options there um, i'm not a medical you know professional i don't know anything about what could be integrated to monitor on your body that would help other than i guess like heart rate um muscle strain i don't know yeah, but that's what they're kind of looking for is what kind of things can they look at trying to see on the battle picture and see hey look i've got a section of troops in you know, grid square here, and I've got a section of group in grid square here. Which one is more, you know, physiologically tired, stressed, whatever it may be, demoralized than the other? You're obviously going to send in the troops that are a lot stronger in their basis at that particular time. There could be systems that allow you to monitor that, and as a battle group commander, that's game changing. You know, knowing the morale or the status of your troops from all aspects, from, you know, psychological, physical, mental, whatever it may be. 
that can all be put on a database and you can see who you could put into the warfighting system set up first. That's really interesting stuff. So let's see what else in the future they can bring forth for that stuff. Now, of course, when it comes to weapon systems, there's a plethora of different technologies that are out there, whether it comes to automatic aiming sighting systems that allow you to, you know, laser onto a target and then, you know, you line up the crosshairs, it goes green, you fire the shot and it should hit the same spot every time. There's a lot of technology coming out to improve advanced weapon systems. Sighting systems being probably one of the most prominent out there right now because it's something we know we can capitalize on quite well. When it comes to projectiles and changing of projectiles, it's a long way from that yet. Caseless projectiles, we've discussed this kind of technology in the future. It didn't work out quite well. It also comes down to a lot of money. Um, you know, off handling of different targets and being able to categorize targets with weapon systems is also something I think is definitely in the play right now. This is a here thing. It's now, it's ready to go. They're trying to allow you to see targets through your sights and being able to cross-reference that with another soldier so he can engage it from a better vantage point, perspective, whatever it may be. That's not new. That's definitely coming into um, play right now. Full auto-firing modes for precision point suppression effects. What that means is being able to put many rounds down on target but not being involved with... Um, you know, deflection of rounds or a recoil of the rifle. Again, we've got many different systems out there that have tried defeating recoil and making sure recoil is as less as possible to allow heavy amounts of uh, suppressive fire go down on target without, you know, dispersion of those rounds. We're a long way from that yet. At the end of the day, put as many rounds down range as possible and hopefully you'll hit the guy. Um, embedded processing, I'm sure that basically means that if you have these kind of high-tech uh, computer systems that work with the rifle we don't want to have a cable coming out the back of it hooking into your computer on your backpack or into your helmet something that is almost bluetooth or whatever it, else it may be that wirelessly connects to your helmet or your backpack or the other systems that they want to bring into play something quite important i think uh, if you want to make all this high-tech technology we don't want cables pulling out and breaking off and snapping off or whatever else it may be faster multiple target engagement which means if you do find a target through your site you engage it can the sighting system prioritize targets as you scan through the planes of the area you're looking at, figure out which one's closest, which one's the most feasible to engage, and remember the last one so that once you've just engaged the first, it will go to the next priority of targets you need to hit. That again is something that they're working very heavily on. I think we're a long way from it really doing that kind of thing, but they're getting there. Friend or foe targeting, which basically means that if you, you know, uh, scan over one of your friendly troops, it's going to come up with a mark indicating that there's a friendly troop there, which is really important for blue on blue of course and back to the prioritizing of targets knowing that what next you need to engage lightweight materials no one likes carrying a big heavy gun even the big tough guys say oh yeah i love carrying the big heavy stuff okay let's do a 25 mile march and see how you do it's just not the way things happen lighter is better it allows you to fight for longer and produce better results for the overall uh, battle management from the CO, whoever's tasking you to do something. You don't want to have to have a whole section carrying heavy equipment. So if they can make it lightweight, it's going to benefit you and the rest of the boys in your squad to uh, go further and go longer. So, of course, protection is going to be huge for the modern-day soldier. Body armor is progressing and changing in the different types of materials they're using, the way it protects different certain parts of our body, and the way everything can tie in modular to make sure every inch of our body is covered but not preventing us from moving in the ways we want to as an infantry or a dismounted soldier. Integrated head, ear, and eye protection is something that can be quite frustrating as a soldier, I must admit. Try and take your helmet off, take your glasses off, take your toque off, take your whatever else it may be off. Um, they're trying to make these mandibles now, which I'm not a massive fan of, but let's talk to those who have been engaged by, you know, IEDs or, or blasts and ask them what they think of having protection to those who have had injuries to the face. I'm sure at this point they'd be saying actually a mandible would be a great idea. It's not about looking good, folks. It's about protecting the soldiers on the ground. They may not look fancy. They may not look very practical for your needs. But when it comes to 
saving your life or protecting your jaw from falling off. It is something that they're trying to focus on a lot heavier. I don't know if they're going to look at a mandible system or you know, a jaw-like structure that they still attach to their helmet. I know that's what they're looking at right now. But maybe in the future they will have a full integrated helmet, almost like a bicycle helmet kind of setup. Body armor is inherently very heavy, so they want to try and make it as you know modular, which means trying to allow everything to clip into it, and your equipment, whether it be your radios, magazines, grenades, whatever, that ties into it, but also is extremely lightweight. They don't want to produce something that's really restrictive of the body, uh, and also it's going to be quite difficult to make something that uh, doesn't interfere with other parts of your body. You know, if you're making something that's stopping bullets. Normally bullets don't like going things that are heavy, uh, like Kevlar and metal, uh, but that's something that I think is going to change in the next 10 to 20 years, is we're going to find fibers, strengthen materials that can stop bullets at a lot less of a requirement of weight. Environmental protection, of course, CBRE or nuclear, biological and chemical attacks is something we want to try and integrate into the combat uniform as it is. We don't want to have to add extra layers on, which is reducing the operational effectiveness of the soldier, because if they get attacked, they have to take that time to don or put on that equipment if we can try and make systems whether it be modular body armor or, or uniform equipment that is automatically ready to go for an mbc attack or not biological weapons chemicals whatever it may be that's really really important uh, integrated sensors is something that can pick up you know targets coming um, towards you or even you know projectiles knowing from where an artillery round's coming in there is talk of systems that can actually from a dismounted perspective track a projectile like a mortar and artillery shell coming in to your location warning you to disperse somewhere else that's way down the line but again these are things that we need to think about and things that may come into the play later on in time shot detection again from it comes from small arms i think that is something that's extremely hard to prevent or detect you know unless we're using sighting systems lasers that are being painted or lased onto you as a person i'm not too sure how the system's going to detect or prevent a bullet from hitting you you know it's moving so fast you don't have the time to react to something like that again that comes down to human nature even if the system told you a bullet's coming you don't have the reflexes to dodge it that quickly so that's a little interesting but i think it comes more along those lines of rpgs mortars um you know long range projectiles that you may potentially detect and be able to counter with evasive maneuvers finding protection whatever it may be there's also the advanced protection capability so uh, looking at you know what else can we do to protect ourselves whether it be um, decoys you know can we produce decoy soldiers that look like us that projected ahead of us to you know tell a soldier that's trying to engage us that's a pretend target there's also potentially and this is almost insane is countermeasures you know if a projectile like a mortar is coming into the uh, dismount that's being engaged can it fire projectiles from a backpack system that stops it from even getting to the soldier once again totally sci-fi but things we've got to think about folks Probably the second most interesting bit of technology for my own personal opinion is headgear or sighting systems. The human eye is very, very good at what it does, but how can we augment it or improve its capabilities to see what we want to see on the battlefield? There are so many things going on when it comes to situational awareness of things that soldiers want to see on the battlefield. Shock impact resistance to headwear. Let's start off with there. Well, of course, as I mentioned, the mandible and the helmets that we currently use do look a little impractical, but they could potentially save your life. I think in the long run, they're going to produce these kind of all round integrated helmets that can just kind of fold into itself, you know, press a button and it kind of sh sleeves down or sheaths into where you want it to be instead of having to clip on and detach things. Um, passive active eyewear which means not having to remove sunglasses or kind of like google glasses they're just in the helmet and, or in the goggles and something that i think uh, they're working on heavily right now this is the kind of technology i think is key to the modern soldier and they're really investing a lot of money into it uh, audio visual stimulus management which basically means if you're busy doing something is there something that can stimulate your um, senses to be able to react to something than just hearing or seeing, you know, a vibration, whatever it may be. There's an incoming threat, message, whatever it may be. 
uh, beyond novel materials. Uh, that's kind of an interesting statement, but you know, materials that are more advanced than Kevlar to stop bullets to your helmet or to your face. We're a little ways away from there too, I think. Uh, increased weight. We're still looking at, you know, in the science labs, I'm sure different textiles, materials that can be implemented into protective headwear. But again, it's going to it's going to happen, folks. We're going to find it. We're going to be able to find ways of protecting our heads and our, our, our eyes better with the new materials coming out. Integrated respiratory protection. So once again, MBC environments, we don't want to have to put a gas mask on. We want it into the helmet already. Again, something I think is really important is a all-round universal system that we put on onto our heads, has visual aids, has a respirator inside of it, and all-round protection for your head. Um, integrated night and day thermal optics. This is something that's really important too, being able to look at night. Most, you know, high value missions that are required are normally done at night. It's not the greatest environments to work in at night. Things are louder. Um, we've also got to make sure that uh, we can see better. So if you're using night vision optics, is it the best way to have to clip these things on and off or just have it once again integrated into your helmet or into your eyesight? So that kind of technology I think they're focusing on pretty heavily right now too. And finally, the least, I guess, cool side of technology is how the hell are we going to power all this new fancy dancy equipment and technology that we want to put in place? Of course, batteries only have so much lifespan, and we're trying our best to improve that lifespan. Lithium ion, all these different kinds of technologies. Let's not talk about Samsung and their phone batteries. But that's also the scary side of these kind of things is when we put these high powered, high density batteries in there. It's almost like carrying explosives on your back in some regard. Acids, you know, all these sort of things. It's a little scary, um, but I'm sure in the future they're going to develop batteries or systems that are inert, so to speak. So if they do get hit by something, they don't explode into a white phosphorus ball in your backpack. Um, but, you know, they need to make something that is high capacity for energy storage, isn't going to overheat, can be easily charged, is interchangeable. We don't want to have to rip off half of our equipment just to change a battery out. It should be a quick modular in and out uh, to fix um, the system that we're having to carry on ourselves. Um, and also potential wireless distribution. So almost like your iPhone or whatever phone you have, you put it on a plate or a, you know, a pack and it just automatically charges. You don't have to plug it in. Something that's really important um, is that technology, I think, not having to put quick connectors in or couplings or, you know, plugs, which get worn down, damaged, filled with dirt, sand, grime, gun oil, MRE food, whatever it may be. You don't want that. If you can just lay it down onto a plate and just self-charges from wireless power distribution, that's, I think, very, very important. Now, I know this system is kind of touching on the entire backpack and featuring all electronics on this soldier's body. But I would love to have, you know, a night vision goggles that I don't have to plug in. I can just place them down onto a charging box with multiple other night vision goggles in my section, leave them there for the night or the day or whatever it may be. They charge up, pick them back up, and off we go. Instead of having to find multiple cables and plugs and outlets and power sockets, that's something I think they'd like to improve on the future as well. So there we have it folks, a lot of technology to talk about there, a lot of things going on, but as I mentioned, this is not all sci-fi and is not things that we're not going to see in the future. There is a lot of stuff that's coming and that is already out there that has touched on many of the things that I have discussed and it is totally mind-boggling the kind of things they're thinking of doing and the capabilities that we already have. I would love to try some of this technology. Probably many of you who watch my channel already are using it. Please let me know of your experiences with it, the kind of things you're seeing coming out now. Um, I'd love to hear what your thoughts on it are. Are they good? Are they bad? What else is coming that you know of? Of course, don't expose yourself to any kind of problems that you may have in terms of ITAR or, or um, you know, trying to keep things safe from 
prying eyes. But if you can discuss a little bit about the kind of things that are trying to adapt to you as a dismounted soldier or even a vehicle mounted soldier, please let me know. I'm really fascinated in this kind of stuff. I hope you enjoyed today's video, folks. Once again, I'd like to remind you all that any information that is put onto this video is purely the opinion of my own, not of that of any other armed force that I've worked with. I am not a subject matter expert. It's purely an educational, informative video that is just to give you a little bit of a rundown of things that they're looking at doing with technology. So please don't read into it too much. Take it with a pinch of salt. If you did enjoy today's video, leave me a comment. I'd love to hear your own opinions on this kind of stuff if you've been involved in it, as I've already mentioned. And and uh, leave me a like too on Facebook. I do have my Facebook account. If you ever want to come chat with me, play some video games, whatever it may be, I am now playing War Thunder, crazily. Um, come hang out on my Discord channel. The link is in the description box below. Also in the description box is my Patreon account link. So if you wish to support my channel, it would be much appreciated. Being that it's YouTube, anything military or firearms related uh, really does not do so great. So the support I get from you guys really helps me out. And thank you so much to everybody so far who has given me that support. Overall, folks, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks again for joining me. Take care. Bye-bye.